Greetings to you this morning. Greetings. I invite your attention this morning to Luke chapter 22. This is intended to be a timely exhortation to all of us. So be sure to listen to the whole thing. This is a, a topic that is huge. We will only look at a small portion of it. We're going to walk through and look at some examples that God has preserved for us. But in Luke chapter 22, starting at verse 31, this is just after supper, just uh, the night before the cross. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he say, said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee, both into prison and to death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day, before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. We're going to be looking at this matter of testing. Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you, or you could say to test you. Now, it seems like Satan had been watching Peter. And he thought he had something on Peter here that he could use to destroy Peter. Jesus also had been watching Peter. And he knew that there was something here that had the potential to destroy Peter. That's why he warns Peter of it. But he says, I've prayed for you. And you're going to stumble. But your faith fail not. In other words, when, you, when you're converted, when you get back up, there's a work for you to do yet. Strengthen your brother. You're going to fall, but get back up, move forward. Why didn't Jesus pray that for all of them? Seems like there was a special test here for Peter. But what a blessing that Peter had Jesus praying for his success. Praying for him to get back up. And the thought that comes to me is, who prays for your success? Do you have others praying for your success? Or do you have others that would be glad to see you fall and stay down? And he said unto them, When I sent you without purse and script and shoes, lacked ye anything? And they said, Nothing. Then, he, then said he unto them, But now, he that hath a purse, let him take it, and likewise his script, and he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say unto you, that the things that, it, that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned among the transgressors. For the things concerning me have an end. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, It is enough. Okay. Peter feels like he's ready. Jesus asks about swords, or he says, talks about swords, and it's like, yeah, I have one right here. It just, I, I think that helped Peter feel all the more confident that he's ready for whatever is coming. So then they go out, and he came out and went, as he was wont, to the Mount of Olives. And his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. And I think what he's saying is, Pray that when temptation comes upon you, you don't fall. Right. Um, because them praying would not prevent them from being tempted. However, with them being properly prepared, it would keep them from being stumbled by the temptation. <clears throat> and he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. 
And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer, and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow, and said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. He warns them, you need to pray that you'll be ready to face this. They were tired. They did not see any danger. They didn't see any need for it. We don't know what's going on, but we're just out here. Jesus is going to go pray. I mean, what's the big deal? We're tired. We need some rest. Jesus was tired too. But Jesus stayed awake just fine. Why? Because He knew the danger He was in. He knew the situation He was facing. And sleep. Yeah, He was tired, but sleep didn't overwhelm Him. Because He knew. And then He's the one who received the angel strengthening Him. The others didn't receive that. Jesus prepared Himself. Peter thought he was already prepared. A little later that night, Peter's awake. What, all night long then? What happened? Isn't he more tired then? He's able to stay awake then. You know, when you're really tired and you're driving, I found that having to watch for deer is not a really bad thing. I mean, it can actually help you stay awake and then prevent other things. It does us good to have, would you say, at least occasional situations where we recognize our danger because maybe it will help us to stay alert more. Right. Be on guard more. <clears throat> um, when we, we tend to prepare ourselves based on the degree of danger that we perceive ourselves to be in. Exactly. Amen. Um, which a lot of times I think our perception of it is way too small right and that's why our failure to prepare ourselves and so we end up sleeping we really feel like we're justified in sleeping because we're tired well there's different senses of sleeping and we're using it a little bit different there now just a, a, a comment before we move on to uh, more examples if you have stumbled, like Peter, if you have entered into a temptation or testing, and you've stumbled, get back up. There's a work to be done. Your stumbling can actually work for your betterment. Mm -hmm. um, I think Peter was bettered by this. Not that it was something he should have chosen to stumble. No, he should not have chosen it. But I think because of his stumbling and his realization of his weakness in that area, he could then fortify that and not uh, be so confident next time that he was ready to right. face whatever. But we're just going to start, um, we just kind of go through as we come to it, um, not necessarily any special order to this except biblical order. Chapter 22 of Genesis, we're going to look at Abraham. It'll be simpler this way. We won't have to back and forth. <laughs> Chapter 22 of Genesis. This was... God had finally given Abraham a son. It came to pass after these things that God did attempt, or He tested Abraham, and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here am I, he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, 
And get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and claimed the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up, and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes, and saw the place afar off. Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. And they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there, and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand, and took the knife to slay his son. What a test. Abraham is not being tested to give up something wicked something wrong. Um, you know, it's not a struggle with his um, inclination to do evil. That's not what he's being tested on here. He's being tested to give up something that is perfectly right and healthy for him to have and enjoy. His son, that God specially, you know, through a miracle gave to him. The angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, and as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time, and said, Abra and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of its enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. You know, there's been many situations throughout history where godly people have been asked to leave, be it home, relatives, stuff like that, that maybe were gifts from God for the sake of some special purpose that God had called them to. It's like here, Abraham's asked to give up Isaac. For, for what? For some special demonstration of something. Um, and he passes his test. And God has a rich blessing for him. He was ready for it. Um, God, God demonstrated to every watching person to what degree Abraham feared God. He was willing to give up his, his own son rather than the obstinate. So a special blessing there for that type of passing of a test when you're asked to give up something that in and of itself is perfectly right for you to have. But it needs to be at the disposal of God or else it's, it's a problem. Right. In Numbers chapter 14,
we had the situation where the spies come from back from spying out the land of Canaan. And they have this evil report. Most of them do. Ten of them do. We're going to start here in chapter 14, verse 1. This is when all the congregation hears the report and the, the effect it has. But I want you to especially notice, first of all, Joshua and Caleb. This is a test to the, on them as well as everybody else. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. And the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in the wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us in, unto this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were it not better for us to return into Egypt? And they said one to another, Let us make a captain, and let us return into Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. And Joshua the son of Nun, and Caleb the son of Jephthah, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. Now, before we get too far in their response, think of yourself in their shoes. What would you do? Would you open your mouth? The crowd is talking about uh, maybe making a captain and going back to Egypt. Um, would you just want to go home and sit in your tent and cry? What would you do? And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us, and their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. But all the congregation bade stone them with stones. And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? And how long will it be ere they believe me? For all the signs which I have showed it among them. Joshua and Caleb are being tested. Would they hold to the truth in front of an angry crowd? What if they would have hid in their tents? Just kept their mouths shut. The position that they had, they were, they were two of the twelve spies. The position they had required them to participate in this. If they would have gone home and sat in their tents, they would have been doomed like everybody else. But they were key witnesses, they were key uh, witnesses in this situation. And in order for them to be spared the judgment that fell on everybody else, they had to do what they did. Okay, so they were willing to risk their life to speak the truth. The admonition there, if the Lord delight in us, I think probably just irritated the people even more because it's like, well, I, we have no confidence that he does. I mean... Come on. And if we look down at verse 20, the Lord said, okay, this was after Moses was pleading for them. The Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word, but as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. And this is how I'm going to accomplish it. Because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have tempted me now these ten times and have not hearkened to my voice, surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers. Neither shall any of them that provoke me see it. But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him and hath followed me fully, him will I bring into the 
the land whereinto he went, and his seed shall possess it. And we know that Joshua also is included in that. They are spared. Now, think about the testing that the children of Israel were faced with. Think about their thought process. God mentions these ten times. And then he passed judgment. He said, no more. No more. You're too rebellious. Back out in the wilderness you go. You're going to die in the wilderness. And they're like, well, why don't you just give us one more time? You didn't cut us off at eight times. At nine times. That was mercy on God's part. But mercy can sometimes harden a person. Make them presumptuous. Mm -hmm. Because it's like, well, first time. First time, uh, yeah, there was some judgment, but the majority of us got away fine. Um, second time, yeah, God does some chastening, but um, there's still hundreds of thousands of us living. Um, but there came a point in which, all right, you failed too often. You're going to glorify me in a more unpleasant manner. <coughs> You're going to glorify me by going back out in the wilderness and suffering a just recompense of your disobedience. Your children, I'll be able to bring them in. But failure, does it cause us to become careless? God forgave me for it. Do we become careless or do we become more careful? Do we presume that we will have another opportunity? It's something to seriously ponder. In Numbers chapter 20, we're looking here at, at Moses. Then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, into the desert of Zin. In the first month, and the people of Moab and Kadesh, and Miriam died there, and was buried there. All right. You have the loss of a close family member. That that's a grief. That's very sad. There was no water for the congregation, and they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. Like, have you no compassion on me? I just lost my sister. Uh, now there's no water. You think it's my fault? People chose with Moses and spake, saying, Would God that we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. And why have you brought up the congregation of the Lord into this wilderness, that we and our cows should die there? And wherefore have ye made us to come up out of Egypt to bring us unto this evil place? It is no place of seed or of figs or of vines or of pomegranates, neither is there any water to drink. And Moses and Aaron, they, they've been through this quite often already, but they know what to do. They went from the presence of the assembly unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. They fell upon their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto them. There was wisdom there. Don't let this situation overcome you. Go get some answers. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod, and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock. So thou shalt give the congregation and their beast drink. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord, as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock, and he said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels, 
Must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice. And the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. Think about it, it worked. Got what they wanted, they wanted water, they have water now. Moses, after years of faithful service, the people provoked him to speak unadvisedly with his lips. Like, what? What did you do? God told him to speak to the rock. He used that rod that was so handy there and so useful in so many other things. He used it to smite the rock. The Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because ye believe me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. This is the water of Meribah, because the children of Israel strove with the Lord and he was sanctified in them. God said, Ye believe me not. Ye did not do it my way. You felt like some other way was just as good or better. How many blessings never come because God's instructions are not followed? But it seems like the immediate result is the same. The people had the water they craved. But God had something bigger He was doing here. And it was important to follow the seemingly little details. We had Moses in a very important position. And his years of faithful service did not give him license to deviate in one little thing. It had not earned him any privilege of making decisions contrary to the orders he received. But the people can do it five times. Moses has experienced God enough that God holds him to a very high level of expectation there. Well, if I would have known it was that important, I mean, who's to say the test that you and I are facing is not that important? Well, it's just a little thing. Maybe yes, maybe no. Wouldn't it be sad to realize later that it was a little thing that caused me to lose a huge blessing? Leading the children of Israel into the land of Canaan was something that was very dear to Moses' heart. I'm sure he longed for it greatly. And yes, Moses could step forward and still be used of God. But it was, there was a price to be paid there. Okay, so if you, a little while later, Joshua chapter 2, we have a new leader. Joshua is now leading the people. We're going to look at Ahab or Rahab here. Not Rah not Ahab. Rahab. And Joshua the son of Nun sent out of Shittim two men to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, even Jericho. And they went and came into an harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. She was an innkeeper, it appears like, and so it was logical for them to go to her house for lodging. And he was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in hither tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered into thine house, for they be come to search out all the country. And the woman took the two men, and hid them, and said, There came men unto me, but I wist not whence they were. It came to pass about the time of shutting of the gate, 
When it was dark, then the men went out. Whither the men went, I wot not. Pursue after them quickly, for you shall overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof of the house, and had hid them with the stalks of flax which she had laid in order upon the roof. And the men pursued after them the way to Jordan, unto the ford, unto the fords, and as soon as they which pursued after them were gone out, <coughs> shut the gate. And before they were laid down, she came up unto them upon the roof, and she said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Right up the water of the Red Sea. What was that, like 40 years ago? Mm -hmm. um, these things are all in her mind. And suddenly, she finds herself confronted with a test of whether or not she truly believes the reports that she had heard. She's suddenly given an opportunity to possibly pursue mercy. There may possibly be here an opportunity for me to be spared. But I first got to risk my life and the slim chance that it might work. Just imagine what would happen if the king had found out that she actually had the man hidden on the housetop. Mm. It's like not only they would have died, but she would have too. So will she risk her life, which she cannot keep? Remember, she's on the list of people to be destroyed, to possibly obtain mercy. How much, how much time does she have to think about this? I mean, I'm sure she didn't get up that morning and it's like, you know, if they would come to my house for lodging, you know, if they sent spies and they came to my house, I don't think she had gone through all this in her mind. She suddenly, they come to her house for lodging, and it's like, these are, these are from the camp of Israel. Um, and then the king's messengers come, and it's like, uh, do I... Truly believe that the Lord your God, He is God in heaven above and in earth beneath? <clears throat> but how very similar to the situation we as human beings are in. The condemnation of death. There's a, a possibility of mercy. Do we present our bodies as living sacrifices? to possibly obtain that mercy? Are we too afraid? Are we too afraid of the consequences of being found out? Or well, what if what if it doesn't work? Um, do we have enough confidence that if it doesn't work, well, we've not really lost any more than what we otherwise would have lost anyway. Living sacrifice. That's one of the things we're being tested on. Whether we view ourselves as a living sacrifice. Okay, move ahead a little bit in Joshua to chapter 9. They've begun. They've begun. Uh, they took Jericho. They took Ai, uh, then we have in chapter 9, we have a, a gathering of nations together to come and fight against them. And verse 3, when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done unto Jericho and to Ai, they did work wildly and went and made as if they had been ambassadors and took old sacks upon their asses and wine bottles, old and rent and bound up 
and old shoes and clouded upon their feet and old garments upon them and all the bread of their provision was dry and moldy. And they went to Joshua unto the camp at Gilgal and said unto him and to the man of Israel, We be come from a far country, now therefore make ye a league with us. Keep in mind, they've had recent success and now we have a gathering of nations intent on coming to destroy us. And who are these people? They come to do what? The men of Israel said unto the Hivites, For adventure ye dwell among us, and how shall we make a league with you? They said unto Joshua, We are thy servants. And Joshua said unto them, Who are ye? And from whence come ye? They said unto him, From a very far country thy servants are come, because of the name of the Lord thy God. For we have heard the fame of him, and all that he did in Egypt, and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites that were beyond Jordan, to Sihon, king of Eshmon, and Og, king of Ashon, which was at Ashtaroth. Wherefore, you notice they know where to stop on the list yeah, of... Yeah, right. They don't list Ai there, because that was just very recent. Wherefore, our elders and all the inhabitants of our country spake to us, saying, Take victuals with you for the journey, and go to meet them, and say unto them, We are your servants, therefore now make ye a league with us. This our bread we took hot, out, hot for our provision out of our houses on the day that we came forth to go unto you. But now, behold, it is dry and it is moldy. And these bottles of wine which we filled were new, and behold, they be rent. And these our garments and our shoes are become old by reason of a very long journey. We think well, that that looks suspicious. I mean, we've read the story, so we know. But it would have been a really long journey to have done that. The men took of their victuals and asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. And Joshua made peace with them and made a league with them to let them live. And the princes of the congregation swear unto them. Keep in mind, recent success, gathering of nations, <coughs> and now we have some ambassadors come. And they, they live in a nation that's so far off. They're in, the, they're in the category of nations that are far off that we can make peace with. Look, sure, go ahead. Seems like a pretty clear matter. Um, Why the pressure? Why the pressure? Quick, quick, make an agreement. <clears throat> a high pressure good deal? Be careful. But it's a high pressure, quick decision you have to make. Um, it may be designed to deceive, to lead away from God's will, perhaps. Perhaps. Something to consider. They ask not counsel of the Lord. Why not? Is it a bad thing? Even when it seems like a pretty clear, easy to make decision. Is it a bad thing to inquire just to be sure? You may end up with some extra troubles if you don't. Okay. The next one is in 1 Samuel chapter 13. We have Saul, king of Israel. Saul reigned one year. And when he reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose him 3,000 men of Israel, whereof 2,000 were with Saul and Michmash and in Mount Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan and Gibeah of Benjamin. And the rest of the people he sent every man to his tent. And Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines that was in Geba, and the Philistines heard of it. And Saul blew the trumpet throughout the, all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel heard say that Saul had smitten the garrison of the Philistines, and that Israel also ha was had an abomination with the Philistines, and the people were called together after Saul to Gilgal. Okay, his son stirs up the Philistines. Yeah, it was a victory, but now the Philistines are mad. 
The Philistines gathered themselves together to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen, and people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and pitched in Michmash, eastward from that haven. When the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait, for the people were distressed, then the people did hide themselves in caves and in thickets and in rocks and in high places and in pits. And some of the Hebrews went over at Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. And he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. <clears throat> and Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me, and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. <clears throat> now it seems like maybe he did this in the early part of the day. And that Samuel actually would have still had part of the day left that he still could have came on time. But Saul, Saul did not give him the whole day. Because it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him, that he might salute him. And Samuel said, What hast thou done? And Saul said, Because I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not within the, the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash. Therefore said I, The Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself therefore, and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy throne upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart. The Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. And Samuel rose and got him up from Gilgal unto Gibeah of Benjamin. And Saul numbered the people that were present with him, about six hundred men. A very stressful situation. Saul offers an offering which he was not supposed to do. That was for the priests. It was for people like Samuel to attend to. And you notice when Samuel questions him on it, he says, the people were scattering. <coughs> you didn't come in the appointed time. The Philistines were going to come down on me. They were gathering and were going to come down on me. Therefore, I just had to make the best of the situation. Because of the failures of all these other people, I was forced into doing something I really didn't want to do, but I was trying to make the best of the situation. Well, you know, the people and Samuel were close, the closest ones to Saul. Isn't it sad how too often when we get into a tight situation, we make it even worse by driving wedges between us and those who can help us the most. By blaming them or somehow venting our stress, our frustration on them. And he got out of line to fix the, fix the problem. It made so that they were all out of line. To, I mean, to some extent, Samuel, I, I think Samuel actually had came within a point in time, just not within the hour that Saul was, Saul was uh, in a hurry here because of the stress of the situation, so he didn't give him the whole. But anyway, when others are out of line and they put you in a stressful situation, it only makes it worse when I myself step out of line then to try and fix it, mm -hmm. fix somebody else's disorder but think about it because let's see for now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever but now thy kingdom shall not continue the Lord has sought him a man after his own heart can you imagine the regret it's like if I would have known that this test was that critical. I would have waited. 
I mean, mm -hmm. Sam, you know, it was just a few minutes later. I could have, would not have made that much difference. I could have waited a few minutes longer if I would have known. Well, if you treat every, every test that way, think of how many, how many blessings you can receive. You won't have to look back and say, oh, that was a big one. I should have made sure I got that one right. No. It'll be joy instead. In his situation, his throne would have been established. That would have been worth a lot. But it was a very stressful, high-pressure situation, and he, he got out of line. So let's look a little bit at David in 1 Samuel 17, verse 32. The Philistines have come up again. Israel is in a very challenging situation. They have Goliath coming out there and ridiculing them. And David, David uh, under orders from his father, comes to check up on his brothers who are in the army there. And he he's there then when the Philistine or the Goliath comes out and says his little piece. It really bothers David that such a an enemy should defy the armies of the living God. So then they bring David before Saul, and David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him, because of Goliath, thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, thou art but a youth. And he a man of war from his youth. David said unto Saul, uh, I, I've been tested before. I've, I've had situations that work on a similar <clears throat> principle. Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock, and I went out, out after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. And David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. There David had been previous tests that he passed. He did well in them. They prepared him for a giant event. It was building him up for something. And you know, today's success or failure helps prepare us to do the same in the future. It can be good or bad. I mean, if today is, if we're failing today, it will prepare us for failure tomorrow, in the future. If we are having victory today, God can then depend on us and set us up for situations that are, are bigger than what we presently foresee. But David, whether in private, out in the pasture with the sheep, or in public, there was a trust that God had given to him. In private, he was a sheep. In public, God knew he could trust him then to be captain over his people because he saw an enemy of God's people and was willing to put the enemy in the rightful in its rightful place. So whether public or private wasn't the big issue, it was rather how does this how does this fit with God's God's desires? In Second Kings Chapter 20, we have a good king, Hezekiah. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. The prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. 
Then he turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. It came to pass after before Isaiah was gone out into the middle court, that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Turn again and tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people, Thus saith the Lord, the God of thy, David thy father, I have heard thy prayer and have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee. On the third day thou shalt go up unto the house of the Lord, and I will add unto thy days fifteen years, and I will deliver thee in this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. Okay, so he is healed. In verse 12, and at, that, at that time Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present unto Hezekiah, for he had heard that Hezekiah had been sick. And Hezekiah hearkened unto them, and showed them all the house of his precious things, the silver and the gold and the spices and the precious ointment, and all the house of his armor, and all that was found in his treasures. And there was nothing in his house, nor in all his dominion, that Hezekiah showed them not. Then came Isaiah the prophet unto the king Hezekiah, and said unto him, What said these men? And from whence came they unto thee? And Hezekiah said, They are come from a far country, even from Babylon. And he said, What have they seen in thine house? And Hezekiah answered, All... All the things that are in mine house have they seen. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not showed them. And Isaiah said unto Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days come that all that is in thine house, and that which thy fathers have laid up in store unto this day, shall be carried into Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. And thy sons which shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, shall they take away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Okay. He's told that he shall die. He wept. He prays to God. God heard him. God heard his prayer and said, I'll give you 15 more years. I'll deliver you from, the, from Assyria. That would have helped you feel pretty good. King of Babylon sends a letter and a present from an enemy. It's like, he's, what an honor. It stirs some feelings of generosity. and Yeah, let me show you. He never dreamed. He didn't dream what he was doing, the effects of it. And just a little note before we pass on. Uh, after 15 years, his son Manasseh was 12 when he began to reign. Manasseh was a very wicked king. He was born in those 15 years. I don't know if he had other sons or just how that worked, but he got a very wicked son. Just one more thing on... Uh, in 2 Chronicles 32, we have a, a little more note on the same event. In 32:24, In those days Hezekiah was sick to death and prayed unto the Lord, and he spake unto him and gave him a sign. But Hezekiah rendered not according to the benefit done unto him, for his heart was lifted up. Therefore there was wrath upon him and upon Judah and Jerusalem. Notwithstanding, Hezekiah humbled himself with the pride of his heart, both he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of the Lord came not upon them in the days of Hezekiah. And Hezekiah had exceeding much riches and honor, and he made himself treasuries for silver and for gold and for precious stones and for spices and for shields and for all manner of pleasant jewels, storehouses also for the increase of corn and wine and oil and stalls for all manner of beasts and coats for flocks. Moreover, he provided him cities and possessions of flocks and herds in abundance, for God had given him substance very much. This same Hezekiah also stopped the upper watercourse from going on and brought it straight down to the west side of the city of David. And Hezekiah prospered in all his works. Howbeit, in the business of the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon, who sent unto him to inquire the wonder that was done in the land, God left him to try him that he might know all that was in his heart. 
Did God like what he found when he tried him? Well, no. God obviously did not like what he found. That's why he tells him what the judgment's going to be. All this is going to be carried away to this uh, fellow that um, you come across as uh, like your friend. So, did Hezekiah think more highly of his wealth than he should have? Why is it that when these these uh, ambassadors come that he shows them everything? It's like, um, you don't do this to everybody, do you? Why don't you take them to the house of your God and sit them down and, and teach them the law? Mm -hmm. hmm. But it says that God left him. Let's see. God left him to try him, to test him, that he might know all that was in his heart. There was some question in God's mind, just exactly where Hezekiah's heart was. Yes, Hezekiah did a lot of good. But the question would be, okay, he left him. It seems like God was silent. God did not send a prophet and say, this is how you should deal with it. The law didn't exactly spell it out. So it seemed like there was there was maybe not much guidance for the situation from God. But the question would be, if God were silent in your text, what would you do? Would it be like, oh, thank you. I didn't really like hearing from you anyway. Or would it be a matter of concern and so you would go seeking out? It's like, what? Isn't there any principles that would apply here? Let's get ready to close up here in Matthew 24. And we've got one reference yet in Acts as well. In Matthew 24, starting at verse 42. Watch therefore. For ye know not your hour, not what hour your Lord doth come. But this, no, but know this: that if the good man of the house had known in the, what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. Who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and to drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay, here the servant is given a responsibility to give them their meat in due season. Uh, he understands what that means, and it's important too for us to understand what God has called us to do. My Lord delayeth his coming. We have here the test of time. It's like, all oh, things are just continuing on, I'm just doing my job, and it doesn't seem like there's any... Um, my Lord hasn't come yet. So then, the test of time, it's like, well, I have time for other stuff. Do you? Do you have time for other stuff? How do I view myself? Do I view myself as to give or to get? Am I one to be giving? them their meat in due season, or am I one to be eating and drinking with the drunken? How do I view myself? Is it about me receiving, or me giving service? If it becomes, if I develop the attitude of it's about me and my pleasure, I will be unprepared. Do I consider it an important test? 
uh, whether it's about me giving or me receiving. It is an important test. In Acts chapter 20, we have Paul talking to the Ephesian elders. Verse 22, And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But what a thing to look forward to. Bonds and afflictions abide me as I'm going about doing what God has told me to do. Looking forward to tomorrow. <clears throat> but none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made the overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. In order to finish his course with joy, Paul would need to have no other goal in life. Because bonds and afflictions hardly fit any other goal. I mean, except just fulfilling your calling. I mean, any other pursuits would be greatly hindered by that. Whereas what he was called to, he could do that in prison. He could do that, you know, bonds and afflictions. It made some things difficult, perhaps, but he could do it. Everything would need to point in this direction, or his joy would fade away. But I suspect it's very similar with us as well. Probably a lot of times the thing that robs our joy the most, well, your joy would fade if you're not doing what you ought to be doing, but... Um, if you have some other something that you're hoping you can also fit in there with God's plans for you, and it's not working because of hardships along the way, it looks like this is being pushed out, my joy is going to fade pretty quick. Because I have other interests that I'm afraid are not going to be, not going to be able to be fulfilled. So something we should ask ourselves is, is our life dear unto ourselves? Or is it dear unto God? What? Well, it becomes more dear unto God as we're less dear unto ourselves because then we'll be more committed to what He has called us to. But when it becomes too dear to myself, it's going to cause me to to pull back, to be too discouraged by the price tag, and my joy is going to fade, and God's joy is going to fade as well. But you and I are answering this question every day about how dear our life is to ourselves, how committed we are to God's will for our particular situation, we're answering this question every day. Does God like what we are showing Him? Or is it going to be a, a situation like with Hezekiah? It's like, sorry, sorry, but uh, your joy was in the wrong place. And to help sober you up, I'm going to have to pronounce a judgment on you. So, life Life is full of testing. There are, there are uh, various degrees of testing. Sometimes we've come into a test that just feels like really big. Um, other times it's like oh, testing. Yes, it's still testing. It's, it's preparation. If we don't perceive every day as testing, we're not going to be ready for those bigger testings or what we perceive as bigger testings. So my encouragement to you would be Pray, you know, seek to get in tune with God. 
uh, prepare for those hard times because when the hard time comes, if you've not been preparing, you're probably not going to recognize it until you're smacked up against something uh, like Peter. You recognize it, oh, because I already stumbled. Uh, God, God desires that we would recognize it ahead of time, that we'd be ready for the testing so that the testings would not need to stumble us. Thank you, Brother Jesse. I noticed that in all these testings, there were victories that led to greater victories, and there were victories that led to failure. There were defeats that led to later victory, and there were defeats that led to more defeat. Um, I think the common thread through all of it was that if I have victory, what am I going to do with it? David had victory with the bear and a lion, led to slaying Goliath. Others had victory that led to defeat. They became confident, they became careless. I think humility is a big player in all this. How I view myself, how I view boundaries, how I view my need of God, how I view my, uh, my discernment, my judgment, my evaluation, my opinion, I got it all figured out, or whether I defer to my authorities, uh, this, is, this is their jurisdiction, this is, not, this is really not for me, um, or there's a boundary here, I'm not going to cross a boundary, I have no right to cross it. Why would I think I should cross a boundary that's set there that I shouldn't cross? Mm -hmm. The humility of keeping rank, the humility of seeing myself in my proper place, I'm just a child. I'm just a man. Uh, what experience? What Did anybody give me jurisdiction here? Then I'm not going to take it. Did somebody give me authority here? Well then, uh, you know, I'm not going to take authority upon myself. No man taketh this honor unto himself, it says of the priesthood. The humility of seeking God every day every decision, every situation. The humility of not being presumptuous in my conclusions, in my evaluations, all that, all that boils down to I need thee every hour and I dare not step out on my own wits and my own confidence. Because you can have a great victory and everybody can applaud you and it can lead to you falling flat on your face. Or you can have a defeat and it can lead to a great victory because that's what happened in Peter's life. So what happens today doesn't guarantee anything. Passing today's test doesn't guarantee anything. It could actually cause you to fall flat on the next day's test. So let's stand together. Someone have a